Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Innovative Donor Management in In-House Recovery Centers. Before we begin today's presentation, there are a few reminders that we'd like to share. For optimal visual and audio experience, we do recommend accessing these webinars using the Chrome browser. If at any point you encounter any issues, please back, log back in using Chrome. If you're already using Chrome or continue to experience these issues, please try dialing in using the phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. Now, to those of you who are joining us for the very first time on this platform, please take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat should be used to pose your questions to our presenters. If you have any questions that come up during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation has concluded, we'll have some time for our presenters to address as many of your questions as time allows. Now, for those of you who may be interested in our upcoming webinars, please note registration is currently open for our next webinar, Living Donor Liver and Kidney Transplantations, Pushing the Envelope by Changing the Paradigm. That's coming your way on September 26th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our upcoming webinar, End of Life Conversations, A Collaborative Approach to Donation. Be sure to join us for that on October 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. For more information on these webinars or to register, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for anyone interested in obtaining continuing education credits, we are offering one set C credit and one nursing contact hour for this webinar. Please note we do also offer a certificate of attendance. So for anyone seeking CEs that are not available, we do recommend submit, submitting a certificate of attendance to your credentialing organization as proof of your participation in this educational offering. Everyone joining us today is entitled to claim either of these credits. Prior to receiving your certificate, you'll be asked to complete a brief online evaluation that will allow you the opportunity to provide us with your valuable feedback. If you are listening in a group, as many of you are, please be sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. As a friendly reminder, for nursing, you'll have 14 days to complete your evaluation and claim your credits, and for SEPC, you'll have 30 calendar days. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Jennifer Prince. Chief Operating Officer at Donor Alliance. Jennifer, we thank you so much for joining us today. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce our two speakers. Great. Thank you so much. I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce our speakers. I also have the opportunity to serve the Alliance through my work with the Leadership and Innovation Council. So I encourage any of you who are out there listening to uh, get involved with the Alliance if you can. It's been uh, a great thing to be a part of. Today's webinar is focused on the benefits of the in-house organ recovery centers. And we are fortunate to have Dr. Samuel Windham and Lindsey Banks from the Legacy of Hope in Birmingham, Alabama with us today. Dr. Windham joined the University of Alabama Department of Surgery in 2001. He currently serves as both the medical director for the surgical intensive care unit and as an intensivist for Legacy of Hope in 2019, Dr. Windham received the UAB Medicine Excellence Award. This is the highest honor available for staff within the University of Alabama Health System. Lindsay Banks currently serves as the Organ Work System Training Coordinator for Legacy of Hope. Lindsay combines seven years of critical care nursing experience and work as a procurement transplant coordinator and shares the OPO, she's going to share the OPO operations point of view with us today. Please join me as we learn from Dr. Wyndham and Lindsay Banks. I'll turn it over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, we would just like to thank the Alliance for this opportunity to present. We don't have anything that we need to disclose before we get started. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm Lindsay Banks, the training coordinator and clinical educator for Legacy of Hope. I have sort of grown with the Legacy of Hope and the Donor Recovery Center. I was one of the first bedside nurses to work in the Recovery Center, and then just a few months later, I applied for a coordinator position. I worked in that role until April of this year when I transitioned to our educator and started work on the standardization of practice and training for our clinical staff. The purpose of this webinar is to share the experience that we at Legacy of Hope have had in the planning and opening of our hospital-based Donor Recovery Center. This webinar will highlight the strategies for implementing our hospital-based donor recovery center, the unique opportunities and challenges that it presented to us, and its impact on our hospital partnership. 
Our objectives today are outlining the advantages of having a donor recovery center, which I may interchangeably say DRC, uh, that is associated with a hospital, identifying donor management strategies that we have been able to implement because of our DRC and the opportunities it presented to us, and touching on what organ preservation technologies we have been able to use in our recovery center. So we are Legacy of Hope, the one and only federally designated organ procurement organization for the state of Alabama. You may know us as the Alabama Organ Center. We changed our name February of this year to better match our mission and vision. We have our main office in Birmingham, actually in two buildings currently, and we're in the process of renovating and moving into more space altogether. We have satellite offices north in Huntsville and south of Birmingham in Montgomery, Dothan, and Mobile. We cover all acute care hospitals in Alabama and serve three transplant centers. UAB, which has both abdominal and CV transplant programs, the VA in Birmingham with a kidney transplant program, and Children's of Alabama with both abdominal and CV. Our vision and mission is listed here. We will end the wait and the suffering by shepherding the gift of life to those in need of organ and tissue transplant. These are our core values compassion, hope, dedication, integrity, and as of next month, we will officially be adding a new core value of collaboration. Collaboration in this field is so important to us. Without collaboration, we would not be able to save as many lives as we have been able to, and opening our donor recovery center would not have been possible. This is a representation of the national versus Alabama waiting list. The wait list in Alabama is at least 2,500 of the current 114,000, probably more at this point, that are still on the national transplant waiting list. And this slide represents the supply versus demand of donors recovered versus transplant performed and those patients that are still waiting at the end of the year. As we all know, the need outweighs the donors, but all of us in the OPO community are continually working and innovating to help bridge the gap and save more lives through organ transplant. This was taken into consideration when the decision was made to open our donor recovery center. We took a look at our performance and the number of lives that we were able to save versus those still waiting and could tell that we could only improve from there to better serve our mission to save lives. So the traditional OPO approach of a donor case is when the donor management and the recovery occurs at the outside hospital where the donor was originally admitted. Donor is managed in the ICU until organs are allocated and the OR is available. Issues that this can cause is potential for delays in the OR time, difficulty in being added to the schedule, being bumped due to other traumas or more urgent cases coming in, and just limited OR staff in general. This often pushes the organ recoveries to late into the evening and in the overnight or early morning hours. We can prolong the recovery process and add extra stress to the donor hospital recovery team and can stress the donor stability and the donor families while they wait with their loved ones through all these delays. We wanted to follow some of our OPO peers and shift the paradigm. When we obtain authorization for organ donation, we also obtain authorization to transport the donor to our dedicated donor recovery center for the donor management and organ recovery. For designated donors, it is explained to the donor family that the transport is a part of the donation process in order to maximize their loved one's gifts. Some of the existing independent OPOs include Mid-America in St. Louis, Gift of Hope in Chicago, Life Alliance Organ Recovery in Miami, Center for Organ Recovery and Education in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, the Donor Alliance in Colorado, Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency, Life Bank in Cleveland, and more that are being developed. Hospital-based slash OPO recovery centers are Legacy of Hope and University Hospital and Live on New York and Community Hospital. Other things we consider when making the decision to open the donor recovery center, more predictability and control of our donor management and the scheduling of recovery. The better communication and less changes to have to communicate with our donor families increase in quality of life for recovery surgeons and staff by decreasing our travel needs. It reduces the process variability experience when recovering organs in multiple donor hospitals with differing ORs, supplies, and staff that is unfamiliar with the procedure. We are better able to deploy pumping technologies because of the close proximity to our organ perfusion lab. 
So our recovery center was initially planned as an independent center, and our transplant centers were concerned that the independent center might impact some financial performance. So we worked together and created a concept of a hospital-based recovery center. Construction was completed in July 2015. Tissue recoveries began happening in December of 2015. This is just uh, our current space. The highlighted is our donor recovery center in the blue, and the green is our administrative space. Um, highlighted in blue is the two OR suites. Both contain anesthesia equipment, and um, with o OR and OPO staff permitting, we could have two recoveries happening at one time. Primarily one is used for our tissue recoveries and one for organ. We have two fully functional ICU bays, a nurse's station with multiple computers for multiple cases, our own sold utility room, two full supply rooms, and we're working on changing the, some of the space in the, highlighted in green to relocate our perfusion lab to be closer to us. Our plan was for a phased approach. We were going to begin with consented university hospital or UAB patients in February of 2016. We began expanding to Huntsville and Montgomery in April. At this point, I had begun working as a bedside nurse, and I remember one of the first donors, if not the first, being transported in May of 2016. We then expanded to Dothan and Mobile, who were not originally planned for transport, in October. In May of 2017, we considered ourselves fully operational with greater than 70% of our donors being recovered in the recovery center. And as of last week, we recovered our 402nd organ donor in the recovery center. This is a representation of our regions and why we decided that this would be beneficial. 50% of our donors were coming from within 50 miles of Birmingham and 85% within 100 miles. So our donor recovery center structure. It's a UAB hospital staff and the Legacy of Hope staff works under the existing hospital donation agreement. We're un organized under the perioperative surgery. We have a surgical liaison who we schedule ORs with, and they provide a scrub and a circulator for each case. The liaison position has grown tremendously, and we are able to utilize her in training new employees on best practice in the OR. She also trains UAB's OR staff in organ recovery as one of the stops on their many specialties that they go through on their orientation. We are compliant to hospital regulatory agencies, such as CMS and JCO. Our senior manager liaisons with the OR leadership and staff. We contract RNs and CRNAs from UAB who work with us on an on-call basis. We have direct and closed access to UAB hospital and all of the testing, including a CT, cardiac cath, a surgical pathology lab, echo, we have a chest x-ray machine and bronchoscopy, cart and scopes of our own. All bedside procedures are performed in our donor recovery center. We are adjacent to the morgue and the garage that enables transfer of donors in and out to funeral homes or the ME's office, and transport is performed by UAB's critical care transport, either via ambulance or jet. We have established protocols with UAB for admitting our donors, scheduling the ORs, maintaining our equipment with biomed, use of central sterile for instrument sterilization, supply management, pharmacy, facility maintenance and cleaning, EMR access, and training of our staff on hospital protocols and equipment. All the equipment that we have on site in our donor recovery center is two fully stocked ORs, fully functional ICU, equipped with beds that perform percussion, vibration, and rotation, our own IV pumps, ventilators, we have our own bronchoscopes that are cleaned and maintained by UAB, a portable x-ray machine that is used, used and maintained by the radiology techs, and we have our own ultrasound. We have been able to utilize ex vivo and Organox in our OR suite, and we have many live sport kidney pumps that are commonly utilized in our perfusion lab. We outsource services such as our serology lab, VRL in Atlanta, transportation with UAB critical care transport, 
ambulance and their fixed wing aircraft, mortuary service transport post case, and we utilize our local ambulance companies for transport of outside teams to and from the airport. Our donor patients in the recovery center are either registered within UAB as patients and were transferred to our unit or as a bedded outpatient if they are from an outside hospital. They are managed by our procurement transplant coordinators under the supervision of Dr. Wyndham. Our bedside nurses work with us on an on-call basis and are fully trained to work with all of our equipment and supplies. We utilize the UAB radiology department for our testing performed at UAB, but they go above and beyond and will also read scans for us from other hospitals after our donors have transplanted been transported and it helped us decrease our the time it takes to get our read and allocate. I've touched on some of the OR management briefly. Our PCC scheduled the OR through UAB. The hospital provides the staff. CRNAs are called in by us. Um, they work on the on-call basis. The hospital maintains and cleans our facility and they maintain and supply all of our equipment. So what we've learned for the future, that two beds is not always enough for us. We are increasing to have a third ICU bed, creating more storage space, and co-locating our perfusion lab, which is currently located within the UAB campus, and increasing the space for our donor families. Other considerations are possibly bringing OR staff in-house and specializing our staffing roles. This is the blueprint for our renovations. Um, this is what, all of this is what you saw highlighted earlier, and it's becoming just clinical space. Uh, we are adding the third ICU bed, a dedicated pump room, two supply rooms, a packaging area, and expanding our donor family waiting area. The advantages that we have noted so far is significant increase in lungs, heart, and kidneys recovered for transplant. We've seen this in our SRTR O to E increase. More consistent donor management, greater satisfaction both with our local recovery surgeons and our visiting transplant surgeons. More staff engagement, consistent and easier training for our new coordinators. Timeliness of testing and allocation. Cost savings by having a fixed OR cost and much less team travel. Privacy for donor families and a safe, supportive place for them throughout the process, and greater satisfaction within the donor hospital. It takes away the uncomfort and uncertainty of managing donors and takes away the stress from the OR for the unfamiliar procedure. A few disadvantages, the audits are kind of hard. We confuse auditors as to who has ownership and applied standards. We have experienced longer case times but we've also seen an increase in our organs transplanted per donor. We have less visibility of the donation process in hospitals. Our coordinators have specialized more, so they don't always get to ex have all the same experiences, such as managing a donor and the issues that may arise with that in an outside hospital, and potential issues that could arise during transport with our donor. In 2016, we had our ribbon cutting for our donor recovery center and it exceeded our expectations. 74% of our donors are recovered in our donor recovery center. 93% of our transport eligible donors are recovered. And as I said earlier, September 13th, we recovered our 402nd organ donor. The reasons why donors would not be recovered in our recovery center, we do not do pediatric donors, DCD, some families will decline transport, Donor instability may preclude transport, and there have been quite a few times that we just don't have the capacity to transport. We were able to use both Organox and Ex Vivo. Those, those are in our OR suite. And we own and maintain many life work kidney perfusion pumps. In our perfusion lab currently, we are able to cannulate and place kidneys on the pump within minutes of coming out of the body. We were able to transport those pumps right down to our OR. And now I'll kick it off to Dr. Wyndham. Thank you, Lindsay. 
Uh, Lindsay has just covered the recovery center with respect to the background information, how it's run, how we are different from other freestanding OPO centers. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, just to show what the donor center has meant to us with respect to donor management. It certainly has created opportunities to excel with our donor management skills, and I really hope to convey this uh, today because it's led to a lot of excitement amongst our team. You know, the center here has uh, certainly helped us to pursue our mission, that being in suffering and offer the gift of life to those in need for transplants. So today I want to speak about the Recovery Center and what it has meant from the clinical uh, perspective. Just a quick background as to how I came to this role. Uh, I was approached in 2015 uh, by the Legacy of Hope um, staff and administration, and they let me know about their vision that they had to build the Oregon Recovery Center. But more importantly, they also wanted to grow with respect to their outcomes and their numbers. They uh, approached me and asked to help develop protocols for the donor management uh, with the metrics of improving the organs per donor in mind, as well as to improve our observed to expected for each organ. Uh, certainly from the numbers there, these are the numbers prior to 2015 that our lungs generally were in the 0.3 to 0.4 range of SRTR, heart, liver, kidneys, and pancreas, as you see there. Uh, all of these numbers, we certainly saw room to improve so that we could uh, better meet our goal and our mission. So I was certainly honored when they asked me to consider their endeavor. Uh, at the same time, I was a little bit nervous about the challenge. I knew how to take care of a trauma patient. I knew how to manage an ICU patient, but really hadn't had much experience in, with respect to donor management outside of taking care of the gunshot wound to the head uh, patient. Um, so in order to learn uh, donor management, and before uh, a donor recovery center was completed, I tried to drive around to all the outside hospitals with our coordinators and see just firsthand what they experienced, both on the front line as well as how to manage the donor. Also, I focused my studies uh, on the Society of Critical Care Medicine's 2015 Consensus Conference and then used that as a, a jump off to read other journal articles uh, as to the background of donor management. The other aspect um, in being associated with a med school allowed me to review some of the basic science be behind each subsystem and really what goes on uh, to the subsystems following brain death. So the center opened early 2016, as Lindsay alluded to, and very soon we began to see some uh, benefits over the next few months. Having the center uh, uh, connected allowed me to follow every patient that we brought here and really learn the nuances of donor management. Also having the center connected to where I, I work allowed me to have direct communication and following the patient with the, uh, the PTCs. And when needed, I could really sit down and teach uh, the PTCs uh, in real time and help sharpen their ICU skills. Uh, one benefit also is rather than having to wait on the consultants at all the outside hospitals to perform procedures such as central lines, bronchoscopies, and such, all of these done, could be done in our center uh, and save time uh, for the uh, coordinator. It also allowed the coordinator to be freed up uh, as they weren't on the phone for hours on end trying to arrange these consultants to perform the procedures. A, a final benefit we saw was by hiring the bedside nurses, all these nurses had a unique and special interest in transplant and a real mission to help our patient. I know sometimes at the, after being at the outside hospitals, you don't see that same enthusiasm and eagerness, and certainly we had it with our bedside nurses. This is a representation of what we began to see uh, with the development of the Donor Recovery Center. The first graph showing an increase in the number of organ donors really uh, highlighted our efforts to improve our, our care and our approach on the donor on all aspects. But more importantly to me, this, the second graph really showed a steep line and it's much steeper than our increase of organ donors as to the number of organs that we were able to transplant. So over the next few slides, I want to break the subsystems down and show what the recovery center allowed us to do for each organ system and how it fed into this 
process of improving our outcomes and our numbers. I'll be reviewing some of our protocols. It won't be to teach our protocols, but rather show uh, what has developed over the evolution of our donor recovery center. So in 2015 uh, and 16, as our first, as our lowest organ system performance was lungs, that was the first project that we undertook in order to improve our lung recruitment. As you can uh, see, uh, in 2015, we only recruited 20 lungs for transplantation, but after recovering, opening the recovery center and working on our protocols, we more than doubled our number of lungs that we were able to recruit within one year time. Uh, we've had some slow growth um, in the following years as to the number of lungs recruiting, still learning our protocols, uh, but I want to highlight what we learned in that first year uh, in having the donor recovery center. You know, so many of the donors have little to uh, no routine pulmonary care in the days or days uh, leading up to the brain death process, and I feel like part of that is because other um, Patient, other people taking care of the donor uh, see that it's a futile effort. And so many of them have significant plugging, atelectasis on top of the edema that they develop during that brain death process. So our therapies that we began to focus on in that first year really focused to try to reverse uh, all these things in the last few days uh, that they had developed. Uh, we are, were able to perform uh, earlier and more frequent bronchoscopies to help the secretion burden that the donors had. Our ICU beds, as uh, Lindsay mentioned, had both vib uh, vibration, percussion, and rotation abilities, and we uh, quickly implemented those, especially with prone positioning of the patient, uh, allowing for the uh, better clearance of the secretions. Uh, as an intensivist, I could more uh, closely follow the flow volume curve and the other curves that are present on the ventilator just to see what responds the best in the different situations of lung recruitment. Um, you know, many of the outside hospitals, our PTCs aren't fully allowed to run the pulmonary protocol despite their vent training, uh, but once we're here, our uh, PTCs are then able to fully implement our pulmonary protocol to recruit. Uh, and as I mentioned, having the bedside nurse there who very much helps in, in the pulmonary recruitment and the process really aids the, the PTC. Um, over the last few months, and over, uh, we've been working on finalizing our pulmonary protocol, and these years that we've had the recovery center has led us to develop our pulmonary protocol that looks like this, in that this top panel uh, shows what all the processes we do on a Q6 hour cycle, and this is very much aided by having our bedside nurses jump in and help our PTCs with this. Training is also focused on teaching the PTCs to help determine what's the biggest component to limiting their pulmonary recruitment, whether it be aspiration in the first column, plugging and secretions, atelectasis, or edema. And then we've developed each algorithm arm to help manage those uh, and better recruit the lungs. Shifting gears a little bit, after our success in 2016 with the lungs, we decided uh, 2017 was going to be the year of the heart uh, recruitment for us. So toward the end of 2016, some of the uh, PTCs and I began to pull our data uh, to look at our cardiac outcomes. I will say that this has been an added benefit to having a recovery center because we could take out all the other confounding variables that were present at outside hospitals and we're able to uh, closely look at the data since the data was all at our hospital as opposed to uh, other hospitals. As we reviewed our data, the largest portion of decline for the heart were from LVH, coronary artery disease, and other diseases that might lead to turn down. We, know we can't do anything on those three components of those uh, turndowns, but the most important one was that poor rejection fraction or the neurogenic stun myocardium. So as we began searching for how can we reverse this, it did lead us to go into the med school to talk with some of the basic scientists uh, down the, the way and help work through the processes uh, and the pathology that's present. And then it's also interesting that as we pulled our data, we noted that the, that stun myocardium was a little bit more frequent noted in young males and middle-aged females. 
with this in mind, uh, we, and uh, go, working with the uh, basic scientists down the way, and uh, uh, worked with Ashad uh, Chaudhry on his work with estrogen, and we became, or we incorporated an estrogen protocol on our, all our donor management to manage the, uh, the cardiac mm -hmm. status. Uh, other aspects of having the recovery center, we have our bedside ultrasound, which uh, has been used to help us assist in volume status on all our donors, as well as I'll perform a bedside informal echocardiogram so that we, if the um, ejection fraction is still depressed, we don't get that formal uh, echocardiogram performed at that time. We'll wait for uh, the, the EF to improve prior to obtaining that formal echo. The, uh, cardiology team has been very helpful in developing uh, a rapid response and rapid reading of all the echocardiograms for us. And then uh, cath lab uh, just across the street has been available to help us uh, throughout our donor management process. And these are the results of our donor our cardiac recruitment. In 2015 and 16, you see that we had only recruited 27 and 32 hearts respectively. And then in 2017, once we implemented our um, estrogen protocol and began focusing on the ultrasound and the other aspects I mentioned, we almost doubled our number of hearts within one year time. Uh, and then in 2019, so far, uh, we've recruited 62 hearts year to date. And so I look forward to what the next three months uh, will bring at the end to complete this year. You know, I've mentioned numerous benefits of the Oregon Recovery Center, but I will say that one unspoken benefit is really the excitement that seeing these results has uh, led to the team. Each member of the team has played an integral role, and just seeing that we can double two different organ systems in the recruitment of those organs has really fueled an excitement, which I don't think could have been possible outside of having the Donor Recovery Center. Following our focus on the lungs and hearts, our next project was the kidney recruitment. Uh, in fact, just before we began putting together our pro renal protocol for kidney recruitment, we did have a series of months where the, our SRTR dropped, uh, leading to uh, even more urgency for us to, to develop and uh, implement our renal protocol. To help develop our protocol, I uh, first started with the literature and to see what else had already been done. Uh, one of those studies was uh, by Neiman and others in 2015 where they performed passive cooling uh, to 34 and 35 degrees. And with that, uh, they had a decrease in need for post-transplant dialysis as well as de decrease in delayed graft function. Other research that was out there had to do, deal with dopamine both in 2004 and then a newer, newer article in 2017 where renal dose dopamine uh, seemed to help the graft function. So with those two bits of research in mind, we developed our cool beans protocol. Um, and with that, we did passively cool all our donors to 34, 35 degrees and ran uh, renal dose dopamine on our donors. Began looking at this in a mid-year review to see has the cool beans protocol been helpful. And we noticed that we were still missing kidneys where we were predicted to, to obtain those. And so I really began to drill down on those cases to see what was going on. We looked at all the data involved in those cases, as well as the biopsies, which were performed intra-op. And it was very interesting. One of the most uh, common recurring um, things in those kidney biopsies was microvascular thrombosis. It, working with the coordinators hand-in-hand in, hand in the recovery center, they had been asking me all year long of uh, that year, why are the platelet counts decreasing in our donors? And once we began to notice the microvascular thrombosis and with the platelet count decreasing, it certainly led to the hypothesis of DIC was playing a role. And so with that hypothesis, we began to follow various markers for the last half of 2018 of, uh, for DIC. Uh, we were collecting D-dimer, platelet, fibrinogen, INR, fibrin split products, and the other markers. But once we finally began to look at those pieces of data, really the greatest predictors as to the kidney dysfunction was the D-dimer, the platelet, and the creatinine. Uh, 
The International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis has a DIC scoring system. It incorporates many of the other markers that I mentioned, but it didn't help us in predicting which uh, donors were developing the DIC. So we developed our own Legacy of Hope modified ISTH uh, DIC score. And as you see, the variables there involving platelet, D-dimer, and creatinine, as we have found those were the most important markers of the DIC. And this led us to develop our DIC algorithm, um, which is, the writing is small, but as you see in the top portion, we're obtaining uh, the D-dimer, creatinine, and platelets, and the INR every six hours. The first uh, question in the algorithm is, are they a gunshot wound to the head or a significant blood-brain barrier disruption? If the answer is yes, they began our uh, heparin drip protocol there on the left side of the screen. If they are not, then we calculate the, our modified score, and if that score is greater than or equal to three, uh, those are enrolled into our, our DIC heparin protocol. If, they are, if it's less than three, then we will just follow up in six hours to assess for those markers of DIC and the changes in that. So what does that look like for our results uh, with respect to kidney? As you can see, there's 2015, 16, and 17, uh, we had the lower SRTR uh, for the, our kidney. And I've marked there where we've initiated the cool beans protocol, and potentially there was that increase up, but then once we've in, uh, added the DIC heparin protocol, uh, as you can see, our SRTR for kidneys year-to-date is up to almost 1.1 uh, for renal recruitment. With respect to other systems and what the recovery center has allowed us to do, and we've been very fortunate that our liver number SRTR is greater than one. We've associated with a rather aggressive liver transplant program, which has worked with us. And, uh, and so we've always had a benefit to that SRTR. But the recovery center has allowed for other aspects of um, donor management for the liver. Uh, it's a lot easier to perform liver biopsies, uh, under, especially under the safety of ultrasound guidance there in our facility. We do have the OR immediately available in case there's, we need to exit the dike, go into the OR from, as a result of bleeding from the liver biopsy, but we've only had to do that in one case. But more and more of the centers as we've been obtaining biopsies have requested to see the, the slides. So this year, uh, as part of our recovery center, We've uh, bought our own microscope and have a, a digitizing ability to take the biopsy and then send the actual slide images digitally to the outside centers that are requesting it. So it's been really exciting to see what we can do here at the Donor Recovery Center. This shows our most recent two-year cohort for our SRTR that we're pretty proud of. Uh, we've increased just about everything. See our kidneys and lungs are just under where we want them to be, but our total is sitting right at one. Um, so we're happy to, to see that. We follow this data very closely. This year we have re-implemented a weekly case review with focus on our donor management goals and the individual donors SRTR. It began with the leadership within the clinical department and Dr. Wyndham and it has since opened to all coordinators because we feel that they have a great perspective of what we could have done better since they were the ones actively working the cases. We have this via a call-in number and we just kind of sit around and have a round table and talk about the aspects of the donor cases that we could have improved on, done better, and it's been very beneficial so far. This is just a progression of our organs, our donors and organs transplanted per year. Um, from 2015 through this year to date and are projected. We are projecting at 600 organs recovered for transplant for 2019, and that was actually our goal for 2020. So we're feeling pretty good about that. And during the first week of September, we hit our 2019 goal of 555 organs with the rest of the month remaining in our year for that goal. This is our SRTR progression just broken up heart organ. Um, as you can see, we started low at our hearts, and then we've continued to increase that all the way up to 1.2 for January through July of this year. Um, our lungs 
uh, has decreased some. This just motivated us to re-educate on our pulmonary recruitment protocol and really fine-tune what we want that to look like. We are working really hard to increase our consistency and get that number back up by the end of the year. Here are the kidney SRTR numbers and our overall. We're very proud of our improvements in our kidney ODE. We've had struggles with our patient population. have worked to find what we can control and hone in on that to improve our outcomes. And here is just a breakdown of our organ donors, organs transplanted, and what that translates to per year. Um, as you can see, we out, have outdone our 2015 number already this year, through year to date, by five donors and 90 organs. So we started out pre-recovery center, 2.67 organs transplanted per donor, and so far this year we're at 3.24 per donor. We strive to continue innovating and improving. The next few things that we have on our radar are C-STAR ultrafiltration, developing a relationship with lung bioengineering to place more lungs, implementing telemedicine technology within our Dover Recovery Center, adding cameras to our OR lights. We're really hopeful that the cameras and the OR lights will improve our organ sharing with outside transplant centers by being able to send and even stream live video from the OR to show that visual to the hopefully accepting transplant centers. Now we're ready for questions. Thank you, Dr. Whitnam and Lindsay, for such a great presentation. Uh, before I turn it back to Jennifer to moderate the Q&A session, I'd just like to um, remind everyone that if you do have any questions for either of our presenters, please be sure to submit them using the chat feature. Again, that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Also, during the um, Q&A session, I'll have this poll up. For those of you who are listening in a group, we ask that you please complete this poll and let us know how many people are participating in your group. Um, with that being said, at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it back to Jennifer to moderate your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you to Dr. Wyndham and to Lindsay for sharing your experience and your success with your in-house OR and, um, and your donor management practices. Congratulations. And, and uh, those outcomes you, you look great. So while everybody is having a chance to put in your questions, I'm not seeing anything in the queue just yet, I have a couple of questions for you. And one of them is, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the benefits that you see to having um, a recovery center connected to the hospital as opposed to the freestanding recovery center. You talked a little bit about that, but I wondered if there was any additional information that you might want to share. Yes, um, certainly I have appreciated it, as I've mentioned, just to be able to con continue my work at UAB, but then play a such integral role over here at the Oregon Recovery Center. It's, it's only one block away, and so my interaction and my ability to participate has been, uh, been uh, very easy uh, to perform. It, uh, it certainly is nice not to have to create. I know other places have their own cath lab and own uh, hematology lab and so forth. It has been nice not to have to create those aspects here in the recovery center and obtain the credentialing and author are uh, staying up to date on those. Um, I think it's also led to teaching uh, the coordinators. I find that the Coordinators are such an important and vital step in, in this whole process, and to keep them around and have them excited and happy is, is very much a goal of mine because they make it work. Uh, and so that, I think that's been very helpful to be able to pr communicate with them directly and let them participate in our success here at the Recovery Center. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wyndham. I appreciate that. We have a question from someone on the line about um, donor families. So the question is, how do families from outside hospitals respond to the transfer process, and especially those from your satellite offices? We find that most families respond pretty well. It's kind of a relief for them not to have to feel like they need to stay by the bedside for the entire process. So it kind of encourages them 
to say their goodbyes. They know that their loved one is gone at that point. And it's, I think it's a little bit easier for them to say their goodbyes and await the end of the process and make their arrangements while our donor is here. Um, we do have ho hotels very close within proximity and we have some from our uh, satellite areas that do travel here and they will stay in hotels nearby and are able to visit. We have a room with a couch and a few chairs, a break room that they can utilize while they're here. So if, if they want to stay throughout the process, we always have someone here on site ready to assist them as well. I will say that I've really been impressed with uh, the families that have come and I think it's meant a lot to their closure and their uh, of th and processing the grief. It's been really neat to see our family support work with them here in the center. Um, maybe that's a grumpy surgeon talking, and uh, but I've been impressed with what they do. Uh, we'll pull out our ultrasound machine and record heart um, sounds and, and place those in Build-A-Bear for the families and do other projects. And so it's been really nice to see the work that goes uh, on with the donor families. And I think they really appreciate coming here. Great, thank you. Appreciate that feedback. We have another question from one of our listeners that talks about basically about the standards or the regulatory guidelines that you use when you allocated space for the operating rooms. And was there any opportunity to limit the build to meet unique requirements of your donor population? So potentially smaller size ORs or less equipment or did you make larger ORs? What type of regulatory guidelines did you use as you were building out the space? So, as a surgeon, I, I might can answer that question. And these ORs are, are fully um, functional ORs. In fact, uh, it, they're a little bit bigger than some of the ORs we have across the street. And that's been nice because certainly with all the different uh, team members and coming for the organ procurement, we've been able to accommodate uh, having more people there in the OR. Uh, they are maintained and up to all the standards that uh, the ORs are across the street in the hospital. Um, so, Great. Thank you for that feedback. Is there any changes that you would make to, if you had a chance to rebuild the, the space? Are there any learnings that you'd like to share with the group or anything that you would change? Um, I'll just encourage anyone who's wanting to build one is to uh, bring in some nurses or some coordinators who have worked in recovery centers. There are a few little things that I think all of us would tweak just about the layout of some of our things and where our supply rooms are and how those are set up. Um, and I don't know that we would really change that much except maybe start with that third bit. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then a follow-up question to the donor families, and as you're getting busier and transferring more of your cases to your um, on-site facility, do you ever have multiple families there at one time? And, and if you do, how has that interaction gone? We have had multiple families here at one time, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to expand our donor family waiting area. Um, we have been able to utilize one of our conference rooms or our break room for one family and have our waiting room for the other, but we actually have had some families that chose to sit together and share stories of their loved ones, and they seem to have a very positive experience that had some people there that were going through the same thing that they were that they probably won't find elsewhere. Very rare opportunity, something that they could kind of work through together. Great. Thank you for that follow-up as well. I don't see any more questions from our participants. I just want to give you both Lindsay and Dr. Windham. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the group as we conclude the call? I certainly appreciate the opportunity we have to share our results and our excitement in the process. Uh, I appreciate what the Alliance has meant to us. I second that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deanna, is there anything else that you need from us in terms of the polling or anything before we close the call? Um, no, but it does look like we have just one last question that just popped up in the um, Q&A box here. Um, 
question is, what's your first step in getting started with this process? I would highly encourage, we've had several other um, centers come and visit uh, because they're certainly entertaining that. I think that that's one of the important steps to do is come and visit. Uh, we'll be happy to show our, uh, our facilities. We did that for, with uh, Midwest and um, our Mid-America and was to visit their center. And I would highly encourage that because you will wind up seeing what will work for your place. And, and get ideas from all the different places, centers. All right, great, thank, thank you, you for much. that. All right, well, um, thank you so much um, both to Dr. Wyndham and Lizzie for joining us today and for sharing your expertise on this particular topic. It seems to be of a lot of interest to everyone, so hopefully this will help folks as they consider um, building their own facility. Um, additionally, I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to Jennifer for taking the time to moderate today's webinar. And to all of our participants, we're certainly appreciative of your time, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Take care.